Welcome to a new vault log. Here is my Raspberry Pi 4, which I got a few months ago when they released it. And if you have one, you might have noticed it gets quite hot, especially when it has to do some processing. This uh, newer processor will get hot quick and the board alone cannot cope with uh, all of this heat. So what does it do? Well, when the CPU temperature reaches 80 degrees Celsius, it will start throttling down the CPU as a way of protecting itself from overheating. And this will, of course, result in a loss of performance. The Raspberry Pi 4 has the 1.5 gigahertz quad core 64-bit arm cortex a72 cpu that's roughly three times the performance of the older raspberry pi 3 cpu and it inevitably generates more heat in the original plastic case just sitting idle connected to a network doing pretty much nothing the raspberry pi 4 when compared to a raspberry pi 3 runs about 12 degrees hotter as it can be seen in this screenshot and they are sitting next to each other on the same shelf in an ambient of about 23 degrees Celsius. This video is sponsored by JLCPCB.com, a professional PCB supplier who can offer 24 hours turnaround time for prototype PCBs for just $2. You also have a selection of solder mask colors with no extra cost and affordable laser cut stencils, so it's definitely worth checking them out. Now, depending on what your small single board computer is supposed to be doing, this might be a problem because uh, it can quickly reach 80 degrees and it will start limiting the CPU frequency uh, to about 1 GHz or even lower if it can't cope with the temperature rise. If the board is actively processing something, that will affect performance, so for those that want their board to continue running at its best without any limitation on CPU power, you really need to consider a cooling solution. When it comes to single board computers or embedded solutions like this one, if I'm running them inside my home and not some industrial setup, I much prefer a passive cooling solution because even though it can be less efficient than an active one, I would rather not have the noise generated by a continuously running fan added in my home. So that's why I looked for an affordable passive cooling solution for the Raspberry Pi 4 and this is what I found. It's a uh, sandwich type heatsink with uh, cooling fins. There are two halves and the Raspberry Pi 4 is supposed to go in between these two aluminum chunks. There are these raised islands for the CPU and memory and they also included a couple of uh, thermal pads uh, and the screws needed to uh, sandwich this together. Now if you would want the absolute best thermal transfer I would recommend using uh, thermal paste instead of uh, the supplied thermal pads because uh, thermal paste will offer better thermal transfer uh, when compared to thermal pads. But for the purpose of this test, I will be using the supplied thermal pads. Let's imagine you don't have anything else, so you have to use what they sent you in the box. The placement of the two raised islands, the ones that are supposed to go over the CPU and the memory uh, chip, uh, the placement is not ideal for those uh, and they're not correctly sized and positioned to go directly over the chips on the board. For example, the island that's supposed to go over the memory slightly goes over the CPU. It doesn't seem to be a problem. It uh, successfully clears the uh, package of the CPU, but it's really close. I'm not sure if it's really visible in this, uh, in this video, but I'll try to capture it as best as I can. We also have a raised island that's supposed to go on the back and it kind of goes over the PCB area where the back of the uh, RAM memory chip is, but we do not get a third thermal pad for this, so I will use a uh, thermal pad from my own stash. The thermal pads they supplied in the package actually have an adhesive backing, so they will stick to the uh, Raspberry Pi or the heatsink depending which way you attach them. And on this other side is this uh, protection film that you need to remove uh, before installing the heatsink. For the island on the back cover, you really need to use a thick thermal pad, something like 2 or 2.5 millimeters, because there is a large gap between this uh, side of the heatsink and the board area. 
Luckily, I had one of these uh, thick thermal pads, so I will use this. It will help a bit by extracting some of the heat from the back of the uh, memory chip. This is how the Raspberry Pi 4 looks after the heatsink is assembled. It's like an armor around it, and I think some people call it an armor heatsink. Uh, but this I'm pretty sure is gonna help a lot because there is a lot of aluminium in here that will help dissipate the heat into the environment. Another thing that I'm realizing now after assembly is that this case might affect the uh, Wi-Fi signal quality. But if you're not running it too far away from your access point, that shouldn't be a big issue. It's not blocking Wi-Fi completely, it's just decreasing its performance because there is a lot of metal around the Wi-Fi antenna location. I've left the Raspberry Pi 4 running with the aluminium heatsink in the same spot, same ambient temperature of 23 degrees Celsius. It's been around 30 minutes, so the temperature stabilized at about 45 degrees Celsius. This means 22 degrees less than what we had before. And remember, before the heatsink, we were seeing about 66, 67 degrees Celsius. So things are already looking much better. For an active test, I ran this software called Stressberry, which is a tool for stress testing and data collection. We are interested in seeing the relationship between temperature and CPU frequency in a graphical form, and this tool can help with that. Without the aluminum heatsink, I ran the test and in the plastic enclosure, the Pi started throttling down the CPU frequency as soon as it reached 80 degrees Celsius. First, I ran the test stressing only two cores out of four and I noticed the temperature increased uh, up to 80 degrees after about five minutes. The blue trace represents the temperature and the orange trace is the CPU frequency. Stressing just two cores made the Raspberry Pi 4 throttle down to one gigahertz. It was then oscillating back and forth between 1.5 GHz and 1 GHz as the CPU was cooling down and heating back up. Stressing all four cores caused the CPU to reach 80 degrees Celsius a bit faster in uh, uh, slightly under 400 seconds, but we noticed how the blue trace, the temperature kept rising and around 83, 84 degrees Celsius, the CPU throttled down even further down to 750 megahertz to keep the temperature under control. And this would have a severe impact on performance. After attaching the heatsink, I ran the test again, first stressing just two cores, same as before, and the Raspberry Pi stayed under 55 degrees Celsius, thus avoiding throttling down the CPU. We can see on the graph the CPU was at maximum frequency for the entire length of the test, and we can also test if there were any throttling events recorded uh, with this script, and there were none. This is a clear improvement. Because in the previous test I noticed it took longer for the temperature to rise, I extended the test length from 900 seconds to 1800 seconds, which is 30 minutes. I ran the test again, but on all four cores, which made the CPU reach a maximum temperature of 66 degrees Celsius, at which point it had stabilized, so I don't think it would have been different if the testing period was extended longer than 30 minutes, maybe a couple of degrees more at best. Once again, we have a clear improvement. The Pi runs cooler and faster due to this heatsink and it avoids throttling down CPU frequency even in full load. In conclusion, if you own a Raspberry Pi and you plan to do anything more than keeping it idle, you need to consider a cooling solution. Even a couple of those uh, tiny heat sinks attached to the CPU and memory chip would help with a light load, but this heat sink case design that I've tried today is awesome. With one of these, you can run your Raspberry Pi in full load and it will never throttle down as long as the ambient is below 25 degrees Celsius. I will definitely be running my Raspberry Pi in this armor heatsink from now on, so don't forget to check out the links in the description below the video for this. You should also be running the latest version of software available because I've read somewhere that uh, the USB 3.0 uh, host controller chip can be optimized in power consumption by around 300 milliwatts with just a firmware update. That was all for today. I would really appreciate your support on Patreon or maybe just hitting the thumbs up button for this video. 
As always, your feedback is welcomed in the comment section. Let me know if you've tried other cooling solutions for the Raspberry Pi and if they worked for you. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next week with a new video.